Okay, today's notes are going to be on chapter 9, and I'll actually put them on the computer in front of me so I don't have to keep looking off to the side. Um, now, chapter 9 is going to be on middle childhood, between the ages of 6 and 11, and today we're going to be going over the physical development, and then the... Uh, in the tomorrow's lecture, which hopefully I'll have up on YouTube later on today, um, I'll go over go over the cognitive development, which will be a much, much, much longer section. So I would actually encourage you today to do this, to read the physical chapter, to read the physical part of the chapter, which is, like I said, only about 25% of the chapter. And then, by all means, do the discussion. The discussion this week is fascinating. I think everybody will enjoy it. Um, and uh, hope, and I'm quite frankly a little tired of everybody putting off the discussion to the last minute. Not everybody, but way too many people. Uh, so by all means, do this, do this section, and then go do that. Now, middle childhood is between about the ages of 6 and 11. And one of the problems that we have is that, well, the ages of 6 and 11 have a lot in common. You know, physically, they're about the same. It's, uh, we'll go over some of the physical uh, similarities today. Um, there's even a lot of cognitive and social stuff that, that happens between this. This is generally uh, what's the, the latency period in Freud's uh, version of development, the psychosexual analysis. But, uh, but cognitively, there's going to be a lot of differences, and, and more importantly, which they kind of don't go over as much in the book, socially, it's a very, very different. Uh, for example, I tried to do an, an experiment recently. I was uh, part of something where we were checking advertising. Uh, the effects of advertising on children in this middle childhood stage. And we had a very difficult time planning the experiment out because we needed an advertisement for a toy that would appeal to children between the ages of 6 and 11. And we couldn't find a single toy that would appeal to both a 6-year-old and an 11-year-old. These things just don't exist. You know, by the time, um, and advertising often expands middle childhood up to 13. And there's certainly nothing that both a 13 year old would really crave and a 6 year old would really crave. So, socially, these are very different uh, individuals, even if physically they're, they're very much the same. Uh, so, there's going to be some similarities and some differences here. Um, now, as far as health goes, you know, some of the physical developments, uh, this middle childhood is a very healthy time for children. Um, you don't have to worry about infant mortality anymore. Essentially, on an environmental scale uh, and an evolutionary scale, by the time a child hits middle childhood, he's probably going to last till adulthood. Uh, the chance of at least till the end of, of end of puberty. Uh, if anything uh, was going to go wrong, it probably would have happened at this point. So we're going to get a couple of sicknesses here and there, and, and people often refer to children as little Petri dishes because they go into school and they get sick all the time. Uh, but really, it's um, the little children are, by the time they get to this age, they're relatively healthy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so relatively high health at this point. However, keep in mind that there are still some things that are going to predict ill health. Uh, the book mentions that poverty is a very big predictor of uh, unhealthy children. However, you want to keep in mind that the book then kind of simulates a, a, a possible reason for this. And as I mentioned, the book has some... Uh, I don't even want to say uh, biased leanings. Uh, I'll go right out and say it. The book is politically extremely liberal. I wouldn't even say Democrat, but liberal. Um, and uh, well, this works fine for psychology be, for the most part because uh, that philosophy goes in line with uh, the actual facts of how human works a, little, a lot more than, say, conservatism does. Um, there are a few biases like some of the ones I mentioned last week. Now, in this particular case, it mentions that, you know, poverty predicts ill health. And uh, so they say this is because, you know, most likely because uh, impoverished people don't have access to high quality health care. Um, but the fact is, in America, that's just flat out wrong. Uh, the more impoverished you are, the better quality health care you have uh, at this particular point in history. It wasn't always like that in the past, but at this point, it certainly is. If you're impoverished with children, and that's what we're talking about here is children, um, if you're impoverished with children, you qualify for uh, free health care, and it's the best health care in the, in the country. Um, 
there are some slight drawbacks in very rural areas where you might not have that many doctors that take that particular insurance, but you have that with any insurance program in this in this country. If, if there's not a lot of doctors to choose from, you got to pick and choose who's going to take your insurance, and it's like that for everybody. Uh, so if poverty isn't predicting bad health because of lack of medicine, what would the correlation with poverty be? Um, I pose that it, it could be the more preventable aspects. It's the social aspects that are affecting the physical aspects. So, uh, as I mentioned over and over again, uh, people raise their children differently depending on what sort of culture they're in. Because we like to call this an American culture, but the fact is there are hundreds of different cultures uh, in this country, and for anybody who's, who's moved around a lot in the country, uh, you'll definitely know what I mean. The difference between the Northeast culture and, say, uh, I did my master's degree in Georgia, really, really wide varieties of differences uh, in some of the beliefs and, and how we treat people. And it's not just because that area is a Bible Belt, although that does definitely affect things. It's something as simple as the fact that in New England, where you know probably all or most of us are, um, you walk down the street and you will see a, a variety of mom and pop stores. Down in Georgia, there were none. You know, I would always complain about the fact that I couldn't get a decent pizza down there because we had Domino's and Pizza Hut and that was it. There was, it was a decent sized town, but it's only chain stores down there. They don't really do the mom and pop type of thing. Uh, and this represents a different sort of independent thinking. They're not as independent thinkers socially. They are very traditional. They have a tendency to do what has been done in the past, so they naturally take to large chains. Uh, I've often referred to like Mississippi. I've often heard like Mississippi referred to as a, as a Walmart state uh, because it's a large chain and they naturally gravitate to that because of the social environment that they have. Um, and likewise, uh, impoverished places have different social structures than rich people do. And uh, and I've mentioned this. Like I said, it's going to be a running theme that this free range children thing, letting your children make their own choices, will often affect the physical development of them, the cognitive development in a multitude of different ways. And nutrition is definitely one of them, and and health. Uh, children, if you just allow children to, you know, kind of the the pushy. Uh, conservative attitude of raising children is, you know, you sit your child down at a big family dinner, you tell him what to eat, he gets three spankings if he doesn't eat all his vegetables, you know, that's kind of like the 1950s stereotype. And now a lot of people are gravitating away from that. And in this case, since uh, impoverished individuals have a tendency to have poor health of the children, uh, they are the ones that have a tendency to do this. Um, but not because of their poverty, because they often get food stamps, which is uh, an, an almost unreal amount of money for food, um, I mean, unless you're buying name brands and a lot of junk food. Um, you, you really have as much uh, as much money as you need in this case, uh, f you know, for proper nutrition. Um, but the fact, uh, so it's it's not money. It's it's nothing like that. It's just the society that they give. They'll they'll often let their children decide what to eat, and children are going to make bad choices. That's why they're children, uh, because they're they're not good at making decisions yet. Uh, they're not going to eat their vegetables, generally speaking, uh, unless they have to. Uh, they won't develop those habits, and. Uh, um, and then you have, like I said, a different society where they'll have a tendency to use their their money, whether it's you know through a, a low wage job or through food stamps or whatever program that they happen to have to, to put food on their table. Um, they'll they'll have a tendency to buy potato chips. Um, wealthy families don't typically have potato, and if they do have potato chips, they hardly ever go through them. You know, they buy them relatively infrequently. Their snack foods are very limited, um, and. Uh, um, so there's a lot of what people buy with these things. Um, one common misconception is that the wealthy people can afford more healthy food. Like they'll buy organic carrots. Uh, but organic carrots are not necessarily any better for you. They still have the same nutrients as, as something else. Um, and uh, the uh, as much as people hate GMOs, the uh, it's still very much a... Uh, a hot topic debate as to whether or not there's any real drawback of any of the GMOs that the FDA has not actually banned. Um, so it's not a matter of buying organic carrots, it's just buying the carrots, you know, getting your kids to eat healthy. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about, like I said, a little bit of a shorter chapter today, um, is obesity. And this, of course, ties into the uh, 
the discussion today. Um, and uh, uh, first of all, there's uh, obesity has a lot of misconceptions to it. Um, first of all, obesity is a medical term, uh, and there are there are two terms. There's obese and obese two. And uh, most of the time, uh, in this cult cult culture, blah, 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 we are so um, inured, inoculated, so used to uh, the fact that so many of us are obese that we will usually see an obese person and say, well, they're just a little overweight. Like, no, 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 they are obese. It is a medical condition. Uh, obese, too, is usually what we consider what somebody would look at and call fat. Um, and that is a serious medical condition. The rates of, essentially they, they are statistically cutting about 20 years off their life at that point. Uh, but we don't see that in this culture because uh, we're, um, first of all, we will rationalize our dislike of it. We'll, many people will complain about using BMI as a measure for obesity. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a great measure. Sure, by all means, there are some people that BMI is not a good measure of obesity. Um, I, I knew a guy in college who played Scottish games. You know, he'd like throw cabers and 200-pound rocks to see how far he could chuck them. And he tried to join the military, and he couldn't because he was considered obese. I mean, the guy had arms like this. He was solid muscle. Uh, so by all means, there are those very rare individuals that BMI is not an accurate measure for. But for the rest of us humans, it's actually a really good measure, uh, considering the fact that it's just a general thing. Um... Now, as far as obese children goes, the book mentions that 11% of children are obese. And, and this is very true. However, and again, this goes back into unhealthy children, the proportions are much, much higher once you start looking at poverty in here. And this is actually one of the ways that we can tell how those of us who study prejudice and stereotypes and, uh, and how different races and ethnicities are doing, this is actually one of the ways you can tell how some, uh, some races are doing. Because uh, 20 years ago, uh, the black uh, the blacks in this country had a 60% uh, obesity rate, and they had more poverty than anybody else and more crime than anybody else. Uh, and at this point, that's not the case anymore. Uh, blacks have fallen to between 40 and 45% obesity, which is still higher than uh, than the 20 to 30% obesity of whites. Uh, but it's dropping, and it's dropping very significantly, which is a good trend. And at this point, Hispanics have a 60%, and this is for <clears throat> all Hispanics, not just children, 60% obesity rate, which means that there are more Hispanics that are chopping 10 or 20 years off their life due to their poor health than are actually fit. And this is a very negative trend for, for any ethnicity. Um, and again, there's high incidences of poverty in that community as well, where the black poverty is going down, the Hispanic poverty is going up. Um, and the reason I guess we, we talk about this so much, uh, especially in psychology, where like I said, the physical aspects aren't necessarily psychology, but this is a very, uh, this is all tied in with both the culture and the society and the psychology of how we think. There are people now that, um, and this is a very popular trend, that want obesity acceptance. They want to consider obesity a a alternative lifestyle choice, like the person is saying that he's gay or, or something like that. And they're kind of they're kind of trying to follow this bandwagon. And just for those of you that don't know it, there are also pe there are entire groups of individuals out there that are trying to make anorexia and bulimia an alternative lifestyle choice as well, and trying to get uh, I don't know puker acceptance or whatever I forget the name that they use but uh, but they want to consider let's say bulimia to be a, just a, a an eating choice uh, and just as accepted and not prejudiced against so um, uh, so um, obesity is based uh, on a very similar thing than that you get a lot of this country is is obese and uh, uh, the populations are growing and growing and growing. It's just staggering how fast that, uh, that it's growing. And we're choosing to look at it in a more accepting light. And acceptance can be a very tricky thing because we all want to be very accepting. We all say we don't want to be judgmental, although I'll probably get into it at some point. That's a crock. Go ahead. Be judgmental. You need to be. That is how we evolved as a species. And we do it a million times a minute. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example of this. Um, 
I was watching, uh, there was a thing on YouTube uh, just uh, a couple of days ago. I was making the Facebook rounds for any of you into social networking and addicted to it like I am. And it was about a, a, a very o obese girl, um, maybe a couple hundred pounds overweight. And she had a, a tall, thin, attractive boyfriend. And the whole thing was about how this girl, you know, she wrote a, an entire uh, open letter about how... Uh, People shouldn't say as many mean and hurtful things uh, of of basically being surprised that this good-looking guy was was with this uh, clearly overweight girl, and uh, the letter was well written. But while she was describing herself, she was like, "Okay, you know, I've always been been overweight, and uh, uh, people have always told me I was overweight. But the fact is, my looks have just never bothered me." And while reading that, the first thing through my mind is, "Really, looks." Overweightness, as you look at it, is about looks. See, to the medical community, it's about health. It's that this girl is unhealthy. She is chopping decades off her life. Her chance of, I mean, in this country, you know, we're all worried about, well, maybe this will cause autism or maybe this will cause breast cancer. You know, the GMOs we put in our food, oh, my God, they're going to, they they give us like a 0.05% chance of uh, higher of having stomach cancer um, for like a couple of them. You know, all these drawbacks. But, you know, meanwhile, obesity is something that will give you a, like a five times more likely chance of uh, of developing heart trouble, of developing lung tra trouble, uh, of, uh, of aneurysm, basically every health drawback known to man. Heck, it's actually still debatable whether or not smoking a pack a day or being 50 pounds overweight is worse for your health. We're not sure because they're both really, really bad. And it's a huge health concern. And it is, psychologically speaking, incredibly preventable. Sure, some people are more prone to being overweight than others. I'll be honest with you. I'm one of them. Uh, I found myself 50 pounds overweight one day. I don't know at what point I got overweight. I just seemed to wake up one day, and there the pounds were. I saw a couple of pictures of me at some point along the journey, and I'm like, oh, I wonder how big, how long I was big. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so I'm just naturally prone to gaining weight, so I've got to watch what I eat every day because, let's face it, in this country it's so easy to gain weight and get big and, and eat poorly. But it's incredibly preventable, uh, as preventable as smoking. You could just not do it. And yet, um, yet we're trying to get acceptance of it. We're trying to see it more as a prejudice against your looks thing instead of encouraging you to be healthy thing. And this could be one of the reasons why children uh, are getting obese in such large quantities. As a matter of fact, uh, we talked about social learning theory last time, Bandura's social learning theory. The chance of uh, uh, having obese children, if you yourself are obese, is really, really, really high. Um, I think it's like 40, 50 percent of obese children have obese parents. Uh, and this is a lot of modeling behavior. If the parent eats badly, the children are going to eat badly. And if the parent eats badly, then it goes to show the parent is not kind of taking their nutrition as seriously as perhaps somebody else will. And uh, so they're not going to be taking their child's nutrition because they just don't, they're just not thinking about it. They're not thinking about the quantities that they put in. And this then leads to their children, and that develops lifelong habits. Just like if you have a parent that never brushes their teeth, and their children never brush their teeth, they're going to have bad teeth. Uh, or at least going to be more prone to it. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Like I said, just the physical section. Go ahead, jump on the discussion section, and, and read all about this. It's, it's really fascinating this week. I think everybody will enjoy it, perhaps more so than the last few weeks. And, uh, and tomorrow will be a much longer lecture because we're talking about the cognitive and emotional aspects.